You know, I, I think if we're looking at the future of um, the nephrology workforce and what needs to be done, I think some of the recent lessons from the uh, Middle East are appropriate in that we need to take the battle against kidney disease, diabetes, obesity, the things that contribute to it, we need to take it into the streets. <laughs> and uh, our next speaker, uh, Wanda Montalvo, who uh, is a nurse and an advanced practice nurse and has a, an MSN uh, as well, is clinical director for the New York State Diabetes Campaign. She comes to that campaign from the Community Healthcare Association of New York State, where she was its uh, chief clinical program officer. And uh, she has done outstanding work in childhood obesity, one of the things that we really need to address. Uh, and I, I think uh, there's a whole list of uh, accomplishments that she has. She's been selected as a Robert Wood Johnson Executive Nurse Fellow. Uh, she has been also very concerned uh, about disparities, was the cluster director for the Northeast Health Disparities Collaborative. These are things we need to address. And nephrology, I believe, as I said before, has to take the lead in this area. And we need the physicians, the nurses, uh, the other members of the workforce team, whether they're physicians' assistants, LPNs, patient care techs, whatever it is, to be part of this effort. We need to take the message about the dangers of obesity and diabetes, hypertension, out into the community. And we need to take Dr. Bonventry uh, mentioned this morning the awareness campaign of the American Society of Nephrology. But that has to be couched in language that communities understand and is relevant. So now we're really talking about where the rubber meets the road. If we're going to change what we do in nephrology, we know the workforce issues, but we have to get the message out there better. And that's what Wanda is doing. So Wanda, we welcome you to the podium. How do I advance the slides? They do it for me? Oh. Just right on the score. Oh. And just the down arrow. Uh, okay, good. That'll do it. All right. Laser pointers. Or okay, whatever. thank you. So one of the things I wanted to start off with is that when I first went into uh, nursing, it wasn't the path of my initial choice and in career. I actually started as a secretary for a medical director. And years ago, when we had a nursing shortage, New York State developed a program called Ladders in Nursing Career. And everyone who knew me uh, said, Wanda, you should really apply for that. You would be great. And all that time, I worked at the community health center uh, at Sunset Park. So I was used to um, really caring for patients, but from the outpatient department. And I'll never forget the first time I was on the inpatient um, unit after I had graduated. And I remember seeing patients that I had seen in the outpatient department in the hospital. And I kept saying, what the hell are you doing here? You know, I kept thinking, why, why are these patients here? We're, we have really great services in the community, and we should really be working to avoid the admission, that we should really be focused on partnering in primary care and community health. But I understood that we all played a very crucial role, and I look at what I do and my partnership with clinicians in all types of areas um, and the community as part of a tapestry that we all lend a thread to something that has to come together to be the safety net that it needs to be for the patients that we care for in our communities and in our hospitals. That care coordination is crucial in order to avoid that 30-day readmission, that family members play a very important role, and that we have to kind of change our paradigm and stop working in these silos. Oftentimes I look at the work as we're all in the same sandbox, but we're all doing parallel play and in order to make the best thing, best castles that we need to make, we need to be together on this. So that's the lens that I use in the work that I do. And I've done a lot of national work and been to a lot of areas across the country. So I understand the difficulties that, that we have here right in New York, but also how blessed we are compared to other areas of the, of the country, what it's like to work in migrant camps and homeless centers, the issues of depression and mental health, cardiovascular disease. So all these things to me are all interrelated. And so I never look at it as just one bucket. So that's kind of the lens that I, that I use. 
Uh, the New York State Health Foundation has been fairly innovative in their thinking as having identified diabetes as one of the crucial areas for us in New York State. Um, these are very sobering numbers, so when we think about the uh, chronicity of a condition such as diabetes, we have 1.8 million people in New York State that um, are really have diabetes or have pre-diabetes and don't know it, which is absolutely terrifying. Um, that there is really a lot of um, pre-diabetes in New York, if you look at it, in New York State, uh, Diabetes Prevention Control Program estimates about 3.7 million adults in New York. That is a prime opportunity for us to really get in the front line and work with our communities and really make an impact in this number because this is where we have to come together as well as the full paradigm through the life cycle of patients living with a disease such as diabetes. There's a total uh, cost in New York for pe people with diabetes is 12.9 billion. And I think when you look at um, those that have end-stage renal disease, that that's where a, a big bulk of the expense occurs. One out of every $10 are spent on, um, attributed to the condition of diabetes. And in New York State, Medicaid spent approximately $6.8 billion on 332 a uh, thousand patients with diabetes. And a lot of that, again, occurred at the end stage of their condition. Part of the strategy for the diabetes campaign is uh, we look at it as a three-pronged strategy. We're, we're really focused on clinical care, mobilizing community, and promoting policy. My current area of focus is really on the clinical, but I really do interconnect and interrelate with the other two areas, which is mobilizing communities and the policy issues that we have to face. Uh, the area in the community for us at this point is we have a focus working with faith-based um, uh, congregations across the state. We're also working with the New York State YMCA on a diabetes prevention program. And the diabetes prevention program is really a model that doesn't need to reside in the YMCA, but there are payers now that are coming to the table to pay for some of these services. But the diabetes prevention uh, program is something that really can occur in different settings. So I want to make that really clear. And the other is I'm working with the um, CDC on the National Diabetes Education Program, which has a Road to Health Toolkit, which again is perfect for community settings um, and is really focused on that key group, that 3.5 million that I talked about that have um, prediabetes. With the faith-based um, initiative that we're working on, we're really working with a consortium across uh, New York State, and, the, and we're really targeting those um, faith-based leaders that are really concerned about their um, congregation, the growing number of people within their congregation that come up to them and may not have you know, the money to pay for their medications, have a disease such as diabetes, um, hypertension, and really facing the issue of how can we help our own congregation, and when you look at a primary care visit, we might spend 15 minutes for that uh, patient in front of us, but yet they're in other places in the community where they spend a lot more time, hours. Think about a Sunday service or um, some of the other services that you may go to. You're spending a lot more time there than we do in a primary care office, and I often say primary care happens at home. So it's really critical that we engage and partner with our patients and the community if we want to make a difference. Um, we have worked it with and are establishing, part of the goal is to establish 275 self-management and prevention programs across the state over the next five years. Um, we want to identify about 22,000 patients at risk for diabetes using the ADA risk assessment, so at least we're alerted to this. We're also using this information to alert the faith-based leadership of the risk in their community and trying to activate what they're doing and partnering and, and trying to um, do the bridge between what's going on in the clinical setting and the community. And that takes practice. That doesn't happen, you know, by osmosis. You have to have people that really kind of know how to be a chameleon. That's what I always say when I go out. When I go into any setting, I have to be a chameleon. I have to adjust to my environment. Um, I'm there to listen. What is it that's going on in that community that they're doing well? Where are those opinion leaders that I need to identify? Because those are the people I need to tap into to be the leader and the voice in that community. It may not be me, it may, it may not be the, the physician I'm with, but it might be someone there that they respect, but we can help partner and, and train them on some of the things and messaging to help reverse um, those people that have prediabetes from developing diabetes. 
Um, the target goal is to enroll about 7,000 people in a self-management program, and, and it's really a prevention program, so I want to be really, you know, hit that point very clearly that we're not there to treat and, you know, and talk to people with the condition of diabetes, but really engage those people with pre-diabetes and the lifestyle modifications that they can make to help prevent that. And I think when we look at things as, you know, end-stage renal disease and chronic kidney disease, that there is a real opportunity to, to help make that not happen. Um, I also look at the specialists that I work with, a cardio, um, cardiologists and nephrologists, and one of the things I find really interesting when I go out on the road is that they're very passionate about this. They, they understand how critical these issues are and have the energy to focus on it as compared to when I'm working with some of the primary care providers that are totally overwhelmed. So we have to kind of change the way our dialogue occurs and making sure that we're bringing all these different voices to the table and um, oftentimes how do we engage the rest of our workforce to help free up so that the physician can really focus on the expertise, um, on the real chronic issues that we need them to focus on, and the rest of the healthcare team around them support that, but also how do we bridge with the community so we can prevent, from these, prevent these things from continuing to occur and come in into our practices that are already overwhelmed. Um, on the faith-based side, so far for year one, we established 29 congregations that reached 2,400 patients and um, enrolled about 300 into a diabetes self-management program. Again, it's, it's the basics of what diabetes is, um, things that you can do differently, so it's real simple things, increasing some physical activity, um, how to cook their foods differently. And what I like about working with the community is that you know the flavor of that community is the flavor of that community. So you have to adjust to what they're used to doing and preparing their foods and just doing it in a healthier way. Um, Year two, we're trying to establish another 75 self-management prevention programs. And one of the things that's been really neat about this in particular is that every place is slightly different. Some places have um, parish nurses that are untapped resource. Some of them may have people within their own congregation that are clinicians that are untapped resource. And as we go out and we're speaking to the faith-based leaders, we're identifying these people within their own congregation that have been members there for years and trying to engage them to be more active from the front and, and engaging the rest of the people that they um, live and work with every day when they come into a, a service. Um, the YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program, again, is a really great program. Uh, it's been studied and, and done, I think it's in Indiana, I can't remember off the top of my head. Yes, Indiana University. And again, it's this program here in New York, it's the first year that's been um, launched. We're at 10 different sites across the state. And again, the focus is on diabetes prevention for those people who have a diagnosis of prediabetes and using a structured program where people can come in and help reduce their risk. And what we find that's been very interesting is that adults can um, help reduce their, their onset of that. And for seniors, there was a, a reduction of 71% using this curriculum. Now, that's something to be very mindful of when we heard the previous speakers speak, um, talk about uh, how, how much more we're dealing with geriatric patients that have this disease. Um, I'm like 50 and I don't think I'm that old yet, but you know, I don't want to be developing prediabetes. It's in my family. Um, I don't want it. I don't want it for, you know, my, the rest of my children or anything else. So I'm fairly activated around this and I'm thinking I can't be the only type of person that thinks this way and that we just have to be more open and aware and identifying people such as this in our communities um, to lend a voice and educate about the, the, where we can change this dynamic. The YMCA Diabetes Prevention Program, basically um, what I like about it is that it's really connecting with the, with the provider, primary care provider in the community. So as clinicians identify the person with prediabetes, they can refer the, per, the patient into this program to help prevent the onset of diabetes. Um, and it basically really has a more of a lifestyle coach that's been trained on how to deliver the curriculum. And it's fairly intense, it's like 16 sessions. But one of the things that's really neat is that the CDC is behind this and they've worked with the United Healthcare as an insurer to help pay for some of these programs. And in New York, we've had some success up in Buffalo where payers have come to the table and really helping to promote um, this as almost like a workforce um, 
issue to help prevent those of their employees from developing diabetes. So that, there's an opportunity here when you think about where are our partners, and some of it could be payers, some of it could be the employers. I think employers are extremely concerned about this issue. And their voice, when we talk about who needs to be at the table, they are also looking at this because they're the ones that are paying a wazoo of money for you know, claims and everything else to cover their employees um, with health, health insurance. So it's a fairly um, really uh, robust program. And there's been the goal of this, again, is a pre, pre-diabetes to help prevent. And the goals are, are very, you know, I think, uh, achievable for those that are in the community. Things that, you know, you can do. You don't have to have extra equipment. You know, I think it really looks at what, what can I do here today. Um, things like, you know, again, healthy eating, um, being able to be more active in my life. And what does that mean? How can I do that? Tips on you know understanding calorie counting and and fats and everything else uh, and these and problem solving right so that if I come up with a barrier I have these life coaches that can help me c come to terms with how can I do this better but I think the other power of this is that they're doing it in group so that is some somewhat um, also led by the participants so that if I'm having a barrier someone else can speak to this is how I resolve that. And I think also when I look at in the primary care setting, people that have um, group visits that are led by, the, by their physician or CDE, that that's, there is a lot of power in that as being another model that we should probably exploit and use more often um, on how can we engage the patient. I'm a true believer that in order for me to achieve the best outcome, the patient has to be my partner. Because without them being partnered with me and understanding what their role is in, the, in this, I cannot achieve the type of best outcomes that I want. And when you look at clinical quality and indicators on why we're, how we're being measured for um, improvement, unless that patient is engaged and activated and understands how to care for their disease, I cannot move that needle. So to me, it's a really important piece to engage um, the community and patients in this work. Um, the uh, New York State wide programs are in 10 areas right now. It's the first year that it's been in New York and the New York State Health Foundation is funding the evaluation for this. Uh, we don't have that many in New York. We only have one out in um, the greater New York area, I think more like in the Bronx, one out in Long Island, those that are around here. But I think that there's a real opportunity to look at this as one potential program that not only can be operated out of a Y, but maybe operated out of other settings in, in New York. I'm also a great believer in we share senselessly and we steal shamelessly. I don't have time to create new curriculums. I don't have time to test new patient education tools. What I look at is what has already been developed, evidence-based, and it's been researched to say this is a good curriculum. So I usually look at things that have been developed by ARC, NIH, or the CDC. And the, uh, new, the National Diabetes Education Program has a great toolkit that is perfect for the community. It's called the Road to Health. And it's only focused on exactly what we're interested in as far as pre-diabetes. And it's a full-blown toolkit that's available in English and Spanish. It's really geared towards the person who might be a community health worker, uh, a promotora. It, I've used it for in the clinical uh, setting for clinicians that are health educators, dietitians. I've had even some physicians and nurse practitioners come to the training. And it has everything you need so that you can go out and engage the community on these are the things you can do. What is diabetes? How can you, what can you do today to help make a difference in diabetes in your community? And, the, and it's this kind of flip chart. It has all the um, presentations and materials, a full kit that you can order from the CDC for free. And if you want to order more kits, they're only like probably $15 if you want to order several kits. I can't think of something that you can get that's a full-blown kit with CDs, presentations, flip charts, and handouts for that fee. So why should I go back to my organization and reinvent more diabetes education material um, for my clientele when I could use something that already exists, evidence-based, and can be you know, ready to rock and roll? The other thing I like about it is that it has all the training on how to use it online using um, iTunes. So you can go online and also access the information and use it in your community. We did a training at New York State Health Foundation, uh, a blended training. So what we did was invite 
faith-based leaders. Um, I invited nurses and um, other clinicians who were interested in coming, and we did the training together. So I had one training in English, one training in Spanish, and it was a train-the-trainer. And what I really observed out of having that blended group was the power of communication, of people understanding I'm not by myself. That's what I heard from, so, from the folks in the community. You're interested in this too? Like they felt like they were the only ones that, was in, that were interested in prevention and that the clinicians, like the nurses and others, the physicians were not as interested in prevention as they were. And vice versa, that the, those folks that were in the clinical settings were probably not as aware of the interest there was in the community to help be engaged and reverse this issue um, for where they basically work, live, and worship. So there's a lot of power in that, and I think that when we look at these opportunities, we need to think of creating more blended opportunities where people can come together and learn from each other. Um, the road to health is very, um, has also a pre-test and post-test, so after the training that we had, we're having a conference call, I think is next week for those that participated. And I also use a lot of QI tools, so one of the things that they had to do was run a, a couple of PDSA cycles, Plan, Do, Study, Act. You know, for one person, you know, using the tool, how comfortable are they with being able to engage in this conversation, and then having what I call a call with faculty or content experts after. Uh, I think that's really important. A lot of times we do training and then people leave and we don't think about what's the follow-up and re-engaging that, those people that were there, and also creating an opportunity for social networking. I think is really crucial when we work from the clinical to the community side. Um, the Road to Health Toolkit uh, helps to increase knowledge and skills on, uh, again, the prevention of diabetes. And I, get, and I really think that we need to look at this work and really look at blending as much as possible the expertise that comes from the community and the expertise that we bring to the table. Um, you know, type 2 diabetes does not have to be our destiny because type 2 diabetes can be prevented or delayed. And that's a key message in, in this training that we've, we've supported. I'm a great believer in, in the things that we do here with prevention. Uh, and the other thing that we're doing, uh, this is more on the Road to Health Toolkit, and these are some of the things that we got from the training, people that participated. I learned that the Road to Health Toolkit works to support, um, for support groups back in my organization, as well as my community outreach efforts. So looking, when we look at prediabetes, then we look at the issue of prevention, again, that blending. If anything else you walk away with here is that you can bridge those things. They don't need to be in one area by itself. It's important to bring the people in the community together. Um, feedback that we got from faith-based participants that were there stated that I feel expectant that diabetes can be prevented. Now imagine the power of that. You know, we have people in our community that are, are expectant, that really want to reverse this epidemic in their community. Um, Judith mentioned earlier that we have younger and younger people being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I am flabbergasted by that. I'm angered by that. I don't want to see that. You know, my goal and my dream is to prevent people from coming in and ending up on dialysis. And if they do, then I need to partner with the greatest nephrologists they are so that we can really have the best outcome for that client. And that's the way I see this work, and I think that we all have a very important role in that. Um, some of the nurses that were at the training, one nurse from Kings County, really looked at the toolkit as what they can use at their workplace, but also how they can use it back at their son's high school. And um, I think that that's the way we need to look at these issues and how we can identify opportunities to help bridge and bring um, the capacity and knowledge that we can prevent this from getting any worse. Now I'm going to move to the clinical improvement work that I'm currently doing, I'm working with a lot of clinicians, primary care clinicians across the state. It's been a lot of fun. Um, my previous work with HRSA, I worked on the national health disparities. I worked, uh, my, my, my territory was from Maine to West Virginia. So when I talk about, I've been to a lot of different types of settings, I've been to a lot of different types of settings. Uh, I think the one that stands out most in my head at this very moment is one where I was in West Virginia and they had swinging bridges. Anybody know what swinging bridges are? They had uh, houses on this one side of the road and they were driving me from the airport to where we would be speaking and I was like, how the hell do people get to their house? There was like no roads over there. It's just these, these little swinging bridges across and a river running underneath. 
Um, and that's what they're called swinging bridges. That's how you got to the other side of the road. So, uh, you know, there is different places that we provide care and, and, and we don't ha all have access to something down the street or be able to jump on a subway to get there. And that's one thing that I, that's why I think it's so crucial that we all interconnect and really look at our workforce and how we need to come together because it's not the same everywhere else. Um, there are definite shortages of care delivery systems. Uh, one of the things that we're specifically doing in the diabetes campaign is that the New York State Health Foundation is supporting and sponsoring the fees for clinicians that are interested in achieving diabetes recognition. Um, and that's sponsored by, it's actually the uh, NCQA and Bridges to Excellence. And basically, we're not in the position of data collection or monitoring, but what we're saying is, if you can meet these 11 key core measures that really follow the ADA guidelines and are able to achieve recognition, then you're starting to look at what are you actually doing for your clients that have this disease in your practice. And oftentimes what I have found is that people Look, start looking at how do you achieve this recognition that it's required to do chart abstraction. And they oftentimes, you know, I'm doing good work. And I say, yes, you are. I'm pretty sure you're working hard every single day. But do you know if you're doing this for every single patient that comes through your clinic or practice? And are you using a population-based approach? Are you able to determine that all your patients that come in have had a microalbumin screen? Are you able to determine when was the last time your patient came in and you've done a foot exam? And oftentimes, even though they start looking at these measures, then they start kind of opening up their eyes and looking at, these are some things that are not happening in my practice, and these are some of the things I can do to improve that. There's also alignment in the work that we're doing as far as those that uh, pursue recognition and overlaps with some of the meaningful use. I know we love that language for electronic health uh, record. And what does that exactly mean? Uh, but the NCQA diabetes recognition or the BTE bridges with about seven of the 44 uh, meaningful use measures that are out there. It also helps to align with some of the work that a lot of New York um, care providers are doing, which is the primary care medical home. And these are the measures that you look at, and these are meaningful measures. These are things that we are absolutely interested in. We know that if we focus on these things, we will have improved patient outcomes, and that's why we've selected um, the NCQA, or the Bridges to Excellence Diabetes Recognition Process. We support the, um, there's overlap here, there's you know, levels of engaged, there's uh, levels of assessment for it, and the terms that you are covered for once you achieve it. I'm not gonna go into that whole bit there. Uh, there's a data collection piece that you do to achieve the recognition. Um, and I think that, that that's when the aha moments occur, when they start looking at their actual data and start looking across those measures I just showed you and realize, I'm doing really good with patients controlling the, their A1C, but I'm not doing so good in making sure the patient has had a nephrology assessment. I'm not really doing really well in making sure that I've addressed smoking sensation with this client. Um, so it's been, it's been an avenue to open up opportunities to talk about other things. The other thing is that we're really putting some real dollars behind this. Um, the foundation has made a commitment to um, incentivize 2,500 per physician that achieves um, diabetes recognition. Uh, it's not there yet for nurse practitioners and PAs, which personally it's a little rough to take since I am a nurse practitioner, but we do support the uh, actual recognition application for NCQR BTE for the practice. And it could be fairly costly. Uh, application fee for NCQA for one provider is like $400, and we cover that fee. For a practice to six or more, it could be $3,000, and we, and we provide, uh, we, we pay for that as well. So it's a great opportunity, and I think when we look at uh, partnering with, with organizations such as Rogerson or New York Presbyterian that is really interested in partnering with the clinicians in their community, this is an opportunity to maybe bridge that and look at how can we work with those clinicians that are referring patients into our hospital or looking at the clinicians upon those patients that have had a 30-day readmission and where are your target zones to maybe engage in this as an opportunity to improve diabetes in certain areas of your delivery system. Uh, the proposal is called Meeting the Mark, and you can find it up at the New York State Health Foundation website. The other things that we do is not just the, the recognition piece, but I also work on hosting a set of webinars and face-to-face -face trainings. I've done interviews across the state, 
with clinicians. And sometimes they've said to me, you know, Wanda, it's not so much the money sometimes. Sometimes it's I need my staff to be better educated on how to do better diabetes um, messaging or education to my patients. I don't want to spend the time talking about this with the patient. I don't have the time to do that. But can you help engage my, my nurse, my LPN, my front desk, and other people in my practice, how to do better diabetes education with the patients, and those are some of the things we'll be doing this year. Um, I'm looking at other alternative ways to talk about diabetes and um, introducing things like art therapy as a mechanism for folks that might be interested in group visits and using that as an outlet so that patients can engage and talk about what it's like to live with a chronic disease such as diabetes. Um, and we also provide, you know, a lot of campaign materials. So if you've been here in the front, there's educational materials that really focuses on the ABCs of diabetes and medication adherence and um, monofilaments to conduct foot exams. It's such a simple thing, and yet it's, it has a really great opportunity to identify patients that are at risk. Um, and I'm also looking at you as giving me topics and opportunities of things that we can do across the state to educate on diabetes and end-stage renal uh, disease and how we can prevent that and engaging other uh, experts in this, in this um, journey. So thank you very much. Um, the struggle's on, and thank you for your time. I think you'll agree that Wanda is a terrific example of nurse leadership in an area taking the message out to communities and uh, getting it delivered in a way that people understand it and it makes sense to them. And I, we're going to try to work with uh, Wanda and the New York State Health Foundation to bring our expertise from our clinicians at, at Rogerson to, uh, to contribute to this, at least in the region where, where we are. So it's, there's a challenge out there. 